I hope everybody's enjoying their dinner tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Onhel, co-organizer of the third installment of the conference series on aging in the Americas. I want to welcome everyone here this evening, as well as my colleagues from Mexico and from across the United States. We have representatives from the East and West Coast, Midwest, Southwest, and as far uh, south as Miami, Florida. Uh, tonight marks a special occasion for my colleagues and I. I want to recognize Fernando uh, Torres Gil, Cocos Marcaides, and Keith Whitfield, who are the co-investigators of our on this grant project dealing with aging in the Americas, with a special emphasis on Hispanics and their and health. I also want to recognize the advisory group for our conference series on aging in the Americas and that includes uh, Hector Gonzalez wave your hand Hector uh, Rebecca Wong I haven't seen Rebecca tonight uh, Mary Han wait raise your hand please and Eileen Crimmins anybody else hopefully I haven't missed oh Elena Batista is Elena here there you are good to see you um, <clears throat> This is also the first event of our conference this year where we're going to be examining, beginning tomorrow, the effect of biobehavioral factors and the social environment on Hispanic health. And a very important goal of this conference is to begin an interdisciplinary discussion of the physical and mental well-being of aging Hispanics in a binational uh, perspective. And our particular focus on people of Mexican ancestry is really what we want to spend our time on tomorrow. And that's when I will be providing a much more detailed uh, overview of our conference objectives and goals. All of this would not have been possible without the support of many people and organizations. Uh, we are very grateful for our sponsors, and I want to include uh, who those folks are, even though they are listed um, on the poster downstairs and on our program that you'll see tomorrow. The National Institute on Aging and Sid Stahl, raise your hand. Uh, we'll hear from you tomorrow. Um, the Foundation for Insurance Regulatory Studies, the Population Research Center, University of Texas at Austin, the Policy Research Institute at the LBJ School. Bob Wilson, where are you? There you go. Thank you. Uh, Office of Graduate Studies and the George Jelanik and Dorothy Cockrell Jelanik Centennial Leadership, University of Texas at Austin. And Victoria, thank you for your support. Office of Special Populations at the National Institute on Aging. And we also received some in-kind support from the co-op. We really want to say thank you. Um, in the interest of time, um, I would now like to ask my colleague and my good friend, Dr. Peter Ward from the LBJ School, to come to the podium and introduce our after-dinner speaker. And please enjoy the rest of your dinner uh, and your dessert. Peter? One of the problems of aging in the Americas is that we all need these reading glasses these days. Uh, it's uh, um, a real pleasure to, uh, to be here this evening um, and to, in many ways, congratulate uh, uh, the two angels in my professional life, uh, uh, Jackie Angel, or Jackie Angel, and Ron Angel. Jackie Angel uh, is a colleague of the, uh, at the LBJ School, as she just mentioned. Uh, and I want to just to say a few words to congratulate you, Jackie, and your, the close colleagues that uh, you work with in terms of bringing us together for the third uh, conference uh, on aging in the Americas. I know that these conferences have been uh, uh, hugely successful. These, the past two conferences were hugely successful in the past and have led to major uh, uh, shifts and movements forward in the debate. And I know that this con conference will be the same. So, Jackie, uh, congratulations, kudos to you and to your colleagues that you mentioned. Uh, I look forward to working with them tomorrow. 
the other Angel in my professional life is, of course, uh, Ron Angel. Uh, uh, I'm also a, uh, uh, a professor in the Department of Sociology. I have a split line between uh, the LBJ School of Public Affairs and uh, Sociology. So I've come to know uh, Ron extraordinarily well uh, over the last uh, few years uh, when he was uh, as a colleague, as uh, chair of the uh, Department of Sociology, uh, and uh, in terms of the research that uh, he and uh, uh, others, and, uh, including myself, do. Uh, Ron Ankel received his uh, PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, in uh, 1981. His research interest, as I'm sure you're already aware, focus on social welfare systems, retirement, and health care access and use among uh, Hispanics principally, but among other minority populations as well. This work that he's uh, done over the years demonstrates uh, uh, the complex interactions between socio socioeconomic status, uh, culture and cultural and other social factors in determining individuals and communities, opportunities and access uh, uh, for social advancement and exposure uh, problems and exposure issues to health risks. Uh, he's a collaborator on the major study of, uh, and I say that, he put uh, in, his, uh, in his notes to me on a uh, uh, study. It's actually the major study of uh, the impact of welfare reform uh, and poverty on well-being of adults and children in poor families in uh, the cities of Boston, Chicago, and San Antonio. This uh, ethnographic study uh, uh, reveals the high levels of disorganization and violence in the lives of poor families uh, that interferes with their opportunities for uh, social uh, mobility. Um, he served as editor uh, of the Journal of Health and Social Behavior. As you can imagine, uh, the work that he's uh, undertaken in the past and jointly with uh, uh, Jackie Angel uh, um, have resulted in a number of uh, major uh, publications uh, dealing with issues of social disorganization, health risks, and social welfare. Um, with uh, Jackie Angel, he's the author of uh, the following volumes, Painful Inheritance, Health, and the New Generation of Fatherless Families, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin Press, uh, Who Will Care for Us, uh, Aging and Long-Term uh, health care in multicultural uh, America. Um, uh, also with uh, Jackie Angel, uh, author of Hispanic Families at Risk, The New Economy, Work and Welfare State, uh, published last year, well, published this year. And then uh, sole author, well, author, co-author with other uh, um, colleagues, Poor Families in America's uh, Health Care Crisis. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, came out in 2006, 2007. Um, tonight, as you can see the title here, he's going to talk on agency versus structure, a new twist on an old debate. And I think I like, and I assume we're going to talk about an old debate within the context of aging in the Americas. Please join me in welcoming Ron Angel. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I gather my lavalier will do. Um, I've, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, I don't know how I was selected. As you can see, I, I've put, uh, I put the accent on my name, on the Angel, in order to differentiate us. You know. the, the, the organizers are very sweet, and they assured me that I was the first choice in, in evening speakers, but I know they wanted Bill Clinton. It was, it was obvious, but luckily uh, for me, uh, my speaker fees are a little lower than his, you know, so, uh, so here I am. Um, oh, and I should get my talk. I don't have it memorized yet. So like, this is an interesting title, and I think as, uh, as we go on here, I'll explain what it is in the context of studying all sorts of things. So it's a bit intellectual. It's probably not something you'd want to read on the airplane, but let's go. This third conference, this third segment of the uh, Aging in the Americans, like the first two, focuses on hi Hispanic health, very broadly construed, and social welfare as well. But this time, there is a particular emphasis and focus on the interaction of biological factors, genetic factors, if you will, other sorts of bio biological factors and social factors on individual health, well-being, and aging. And so I think uh, 
you know, environment organization interactions have interested health researchers for decades. It's just, it's an old tradition. Uh, but more recently, the mapping of the human genome has, uh, has given rise to the possibility of a new depth in our understanding of how individual genetic factors interact with environment uh, to affect health and the possibility uh, and possibly other aspects of, ho of human behavior, including aging processes. And so uh, that's what we're up to. At the beginning of this conference, uh, my task, or the way I choose to interpret it, is to direct our attention to important uh, general issues related to the promise and uh, some of the potential dangers inherent in the introduction of biomarkers into social, social scientifically informed inquiry. I am a member of the Board of Governors of the National Center for Health Statistics, which is the agency uh, charged with collecting health statistics on the American population. And the deba debate there as to whether we should collect bio, biological information, biomarkers, is ongoing because of the nature, the potential problems in identification, in uh, you know, issues, collecting information on people's genes is a touchy topic. And I think this uh, conference should deal with some of those. Scientists in, the, uh, in all disciplines are always searching for uh, the new paradigm that will quickly and radically alter normal science and take us in new and productive directions. Most often, though, paradigm shifts, shifts are, uh, are rather modest and within a few years um, are themselves part of normal science. Huge transitions such as natural selection or uh, relativity are relatively rare, are rare indeed. So a decade from now, we will we'll have a better idea of where biomarkers are useful and where they are not, and perhaps even where the attempt to employ biomarkers or biological information impedes a general understanding of complex social problems. Understanding how environment, uh, environmental factors interact with biological factors to affect health and other outcomes is a major undertaking because, as you might appreciate, because of the inherent complexity of the systems that we must deal with at every level. Although twin studies, twin studies are the historical way in which we've understood genetics, they have shown that almost all aspects of human behavior have a genetic component. Finding a single polymorphism, though, or a gene, that is, that accounts for individual differences in, uh, is usually impossible or very difficult since the determination of complex uh, social behaviors, so complex health outcomes, uh, includes, including most diseases, is, uh, you know, results from multiple genetic interactions. So that's very difficult. Um, defining and delineating the environment is another major challenge in which, uh, you know, in which organisms live. Um, although characterizing the environment in which fruit flies live may be straightforward, you know, for humans the environment includes the social, the cultural, political, and economic systems that immediately affect our lives on a daily basis. So the environment's a very complex uh, notion. Other difficulties arise in defining and delineating outcome measures like disease, like what it like, you know, healthy aging. Um, especially, you know, it is difficult to, uh, to define, dealing with specific diseases like diabetes may be simple. Other more complex concepts are not so simple. Uh, perhaps I should begin here by, uh, you know, explaining the title of my talk, since it refers to the concepts of agency and structure. Probably should say agency and structure, not necessarily versus. These are concepts that not everybody is familiar with. They're, you know, fairly common in the Western intellectual tradition, but let me just simplify what they mean. In social theory, sort of social theory that sociologists deal with, agency refers to individuals, specifically in their capacity to act as agents in their own or on their own behalf. Uh, it refers to humans' ability to exercise their free will and engage in instrumental action both individually and collectively. Uh, more basically, it refers to the capacity of human action to change the environment. What do we do? We change the environment intentionally or unintentionally, but 
To the extent that it is, it is conscious and willful, it, we act as agents. Structure, on the hand, other hand, is everything that keeps us from doing so, from acting in, uh, from exercising our, our free will, for, from acting as autonomous agents. These factors include social class, education, religion, gender, ethnicity, customs, and much more that we are aware of in the social sciences. Currently, and you know, clearly this list of structural constraints on human agency also includes basic biological and genetic factors. What's impo most important from our perspective is the extent of control an individual or a group has over their individual and collective lives, including their health. Ergo, this brings us to the issue of Hispanic aging and control over one's life. The real challenge for the conference, it seems to me, and uh, perhaps a simpler way of st stating the problem of agency and structure of individuals and the stuff and their capacity to act in, with free will and the constraints that they face in doing so is to pose the core question as follows. To what extent do individual Hispanics control their lives and their health and to what extent are their lives and their health affected by factors outside their control, including genetic factors or biological factors. This question takes on a particularly salient, particular salience when one's ability to control one's life is constrained by social class factors related to historical disadvantage based on race and ethnicity. So the sociologist in me looks at the constraints, the historical constraints that make the game unfair. Now, in addition to agency and structure, uh, I think it's necessary that we confront the, at the, in the conference, cons uh, confront the issue of level of measurement. Here I'm teaching my methods course again, right? Which refers to the entities about, about which we theorize and on which we make observations. One can focus on the individual as a unit of analysis. This is very common in social and biological sciences. Uh, or one can focus on collectivities. And indeed, looking at individual Hispanics or collections of Hispanics, uh, such as families, neighborhoods, or communities. One can even focus on entire nations or on the human population as a whole. One can and make comparisons on the, on the, on the basis of, of, G, of GDP, uh, electricity consumption, CO2 emissions, all sorts of things. Theories and observations uh, is based, that is based on individual level analysis are referred to as micro studies, like in a microscope. Theories and observations based on large groups or collectivities are referred to as macro studies. Since, this, since these concepts are so central to what I think the conference is up to, it's important to, um, to you know, to the objectives, to our objectives. To let, let me attempt to, to allow me to uh, attempt to reiterate or, or relate these issues to the, le to the of level of measurement to the issue of agency and structure, and ultimately to health. Um, for demographers, boom. <clears throat> Here's a, a graph. It comes from demography. For demographers, one of the most important characteristics of a population is its age structure. Why so? Here's the first slide. Here's an age, the age structure. This is called a population pyramid. This is one way in which demographers uh, characterize populations in terms of their age structure. Here we have a figure that, has, uh, the d d that describes the Afghani, Afghani population in 19, uh, 2009 uh, to the right. Uh, in the red, we see the age distribution for women to the left for men. In terms and down up the middle, we have their ages. So we see that uh, for the, for the um, Afghan, Afghan pop population is a very young population. This is indeed a pyramid, which is why we refer to these as, as pyramids. The age structure of a population is a quintessentially macro characteristic. It refers to a characteristic of the collectivity. Um, Populations are, of course, made up of individuals, each of whom has a particular age, but collectively they have a, 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 an aggregate characteristic. A population's age structure has profound social, economic, and political implications that affect individuals, institutions, and society at large. The age structure is associated with population health profiles. 
in ways that we are that are well understood, as well as the need for different sorts of health care. Uh, healthcare. Nations, regions, and groups with high fertility tend to be young and need educational and occupational opportunities for large numbers of young people, as well as a health care system focused on the acute uh, illnesses that are characteristic of that age population. Um, a young population represents a pot potentially large labor force and uh, what has been termed a demographic dividend. So Mexico, here's the population pyramid for Mexico in 2009. It's not quite so much of a pyramid anymore, right? Not like Afghanistan. It's a relatively young population. Um, um, it has a younger population, which should provide it with a lot of people in, in the working ages and, uh, and, you know, the, and make possible rather rapid economic growth. Unfortunately, most developing countries lack the economic resources to assure their young people the health care, education, labor force opportunities that they need. As a result, uh, the, the productive potential of the youth, of youth of a young population is lost uh, or squandered. And, uh, and as we've witnessed in many parts of the world, young people with no meaningful alternatives often uh, turn to um, political uh, radicalism or religious extremism, and uh, often with a great deal of resentment of, of the West. So uh, age structure is very important. As populations age, they begin to look different. Here's the United States in 2009. We're no longer a young population. Um, and the populations of this sort increasingly um, you know, manifest the chronic diseases um, that, man that, that are common in late and mature adulthood. Educational systems, everything in society changes. Educational systems must adapt to relatively smaller cohorts of school-aged children. Um, you know, schools were booming and had barracks and, uh, and annexes when the baby boom was young. After that period, they had to constrain themselves. They often must adapt, as we're seeing today, to racially changing uh, populations, racially and ethnically different uh, school-age populations, as fertility shifts from the majority population to ethnic and migration and, and immigrant populations. Many, I, mean, I could go on and on. Many of the social major, let's look at the longest lived population in the world at the present time is which country? Japan. And here, of course, we've lost any semblance of a pyramid. And Japan then, you can imagine, uh, and the, po the point I'm making here is that we talk about the entity, this unit of analysis, in very different ways than we would about individuals. Countries are individuals that are characterized by these, uh, these characteristics. Um, I could go on. Um, on and on. Let me skip here. A major problem that has kept generations of theorists, let me go on to one more slide here to leave it up for the rest, <laughs> a little pitch for uh, <laughs> our latest book. And so you can stare at that for the remainder of the, of the evening. Um, <clears throat> why not? Anyway, uh, so a major problem that's kept generations of theorists up at night relates to the combination of levels of analysis and, 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 and the development of, of, of explanations of any number of outcomes from different levels of analysis. Um, individuals clearly live in collectivities that are defined and ruled by institutions or norms, depending on one's theoretic, however you char characterize those things. Obviously, biology dictates much of even complex social behavior. Humans, for example, unlike orangutans, are social uh, creatures and live in groups. Um, in this, uh, in this regard, we're more like chimpanzees. If you've ever seen a ch chimpanzee separated from the group, the poor thing is freaked out. They want, you know, where are you guys? I want to get back. Orangutans are kicked out by their mom at age two and live solitary lives in the forest. So each species has its own characteristics. General observations, though, such as the fact that humans um, tend to be aggressive and that, you know, we're always at war. Um, you know, or that conflict is common are not particularly insightful. The real question uh, for us is how and when are biological or genetic uh, explanations likely to be useful? So a major question for the conference, it seems to me, and for researchers more generally, is how will an understanding of human biology 
and biological factors inform our understanding of the social aspects of aging in new and, uh, and novel ways, especially with relation to race, ethnicity, and social class, the interaction of these very complex things. So um, you know, the question is, how, you know, how, are, how are sociologists going to uh, benefit or combine their expertise with that of other people from other disciplines? And that's the task you've set yourself. Now, let's talk, let me just talk for a while about the potential utility of uh, a biological or genetic approach. The utility of the genetic approach clearly depends on the question of interest. Medical genetics, it's, there's little doubt now, will rapidly further our understanding of disease. Uh, behavioral genetics will contribute to our understanding of heritable behaviors and perhaps some aspects of personality such as risk taking or the propensity to depression. I mean, there are very different, definite uh, there's avenues to, in which we will progress. It's, uh, it's very likely that in both of these cases that I just mentioned, we'll see progress in the understanding of how aspects of the environment, of the, both the physical and social environment, will influence the expression of specific, you know, the, the, the actions of specific predispositions. But other questions that many of us are interested in related to race and ethnicity as social constructions or questions related to collective characteristics uh, and institutional actions will not necessarily benefit from a discourse based on the language of genetics or biology more generally. And I think uh, I would charge the conference with discussing this. Understanding Bretton Woods and the international monetary system, for example, or explaining the conflict between Shiite and Sunni Muslim Islam. is uh, you know, understanding immigration policy in the European Union, or, uh, you know, explaining the recent defeat of social democrats in Japan are just not questions that lend themselves to genetic or biological explanations. These are just at a different level of analysis. Other more salient examples might be the seriously high rate of high school dropout among Mexican Americans, or very low levels of wealth accumulation among Mexican origin, Hispanic, and African families. Um, how do biological, the, the discourse of biology help us understand these? These are domains in, in which it's not obvious. So I think it's very clear that we have to differentiate and understand where, when, and why. Biological, even biology environment interactions will help. Um, it's pretty clear, it's fairly clear that the problems of Hispanic subgroups, the Hispanic population more generally, must be addressed from multiple levels of uh, analysis and intervention. And hopefully this conference can help illuminate the various possibilities. Um, approaches that focus solely on the individual or biological levels of analysis run the risk of failing to understand or to deal with the impact of macro structures, the big structures. Factors that determine group specific educational and occupational opportunities and disadvantages as well as the working and living conditions that expose individuals and communities to occupational and environmental pathogens. So on the other hand, approaches that ignore biology fail to take advantage of opportunities to refine individual risk profiles. Now I think uh, the new interest in genetics and biology in the social sciences or in this, or just in general, is, is fueled by the fact that, that we are really are running up against a, uh, a wall in the use of standard survey-based self-reported uh, measures of health behavior, illness, and, uh, and health outcomes. So there's just, you know, there's, there's a longing for something else, for a new paradigm, for a new set of techniques. Much of the literature on Hispanics or Mexican origin health outcomes, or those of any other group for that matter, uh, cannot deal with individual differences in disease susceptibility to the extent they would like to, since information on risk factors is limited. It's limited to what you can get, and we want more. So then, both theor theoretically and practically, it seems to me, it is imperative that we deal with the very real problems involved in the combination of information from different levels of analysis. The problem in explaining higher order structures on the basis of lower order phenomenon uh, our, our phenomena are today the same as they always have been. Uh, the behavior of higher order, the actions and behavior of higher order systems cannot be inferred from the nature of 
their constituent elements, lower orders. That's referred to as in philosophy as the problems of emergence. Machines, computers do things that are inexplicable in terms of the basic simple switching mechanisms on which they are based. So if something occurs, complex systems take on a life of their own and must be understood at the level of complex systems. So um, nonetheless, the um, appropriate level, um, the use of, of different levels of analysis uh, offers great promise. Uh, and for, for, for our purposes, I think it, it, uh, one of the great promises is in the capacity or the possibility of, of uh, developing more accurate uh, identification and understanding of risk, the concept of risk. Uh, who's at risk for a particular disease? We know that Mexican or indi origin individuals are, as a group, at elevated risk of di uh, diabetes and its complications. It's a serious problem, even in adolescence. Yet, like all human populations, the Me Mexican origin po population is highly outbred. You know, use a sort of horse breeder or dog breeder terminology. It means that you know there's a big, wide range of Mexicans or of any other population. We're not one genetic uh, entity. Um, the label Mexican American or Mexican origin itself represents more of a political label than a meaningful genetic or medical category. So the promising contribution of genetics is in allowing us to more accurately identify those individuals at highest, at highest risk of specific diseases and their complications. Um, it might also make more targeted and effective interventions possible. So that's it. Current risk profiles, for example, for heart disease are based on demographic and behavioral information as well as a battery of blood tests to measure cholesterol level, for example, and triglycerides. Yet, as we know, although this specificity clearly improves our ability to guess who's going to uh, get into trouble in a cardiovascular sense, uh, some people who are at high risk, who have a, a very negative profile, never have a heart attack. Other individuals who have none of the risk factors that we identify end up having a heart attack, a fatal heart attack, before showing any symptoms. Lance Armstrong as we all know, had metastasized t testicular cancer that had, that had lodged in his brain. This is a situation with a very, very poor prognosis. Yet, he responded beautifully to a regimen of three drugs, three anti-cancer drugs, and went on to win seven tours to France and place in, a, in an eighth. Now, uh, other men with what appears to be exactly the same s cancer of the same, uh, of the same sort, hardly respond at all. You, you read about them in the obit section. Uh, you know, obviously, very likely, Armstrong's cancer is, is, was different at the genetic level. Something about it was different, and Armstrong himself, that uh, you know, accounted for his response. Uh, one of the great promises of genetic medicine is, is uh, refining risk profiles to better target chemotherapy and other treatments. Now, it, will be very, it would be very useful to know when a particular drug is likely to be effective and what it, when it is unlikely to be effective. Now, um, each day, as we know, researchers are finding new uh, potential genetic risk factors for diseases such as Alzheimer's, heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, and many more things in large population studies. And they're identifying you know, we're better understanding phenotypic expressions of genotypes, whatever we say. If effective prevention or early treatment were developed, the identification of such genetic risk factors might allow us to pre prevent the full onset of the disease uh, for at least some people, some subset of the population. Genetic holds out hope for the diagnosis and treatment of mental illness as well, um, such as bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Uh, in the case of mental illness, the identification of genetic risk factors is particularly useful since we have no other physical signs of the disease. There's no blood test for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. So some better understanding of the biological source of the disease would be useful. Um, um, however, you know, this is where we start getting into a fuzzy area. Unlike physical illnesses in which there ob are objective signs of the disease, in mental disorders there usually are not. Now, as we move further from signs, which are what, you know, the objective 
signs of a disease that a doctor can diagnose through a, in a blood test or something else, we get into uh, um, symptoms that very often comprise disorders with a, that are socially constructed. So for example, uh, mental illnesses, especially when they include the vaguer diseases that you see in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, like uh, you know, adult adjustment disorder, dependent personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. Where are the genetic markers for these things? Um, let me give you one example, and I didn't make a slide for this thing, about a, 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 an actual study, and throw some words around here. In uh, Science in 2002, there was an article that was of interest to me because of the particular enzyme it was dealing with. Uh, it's an interesting paper that appeared uh, in 2000, and it illustrates the potential for increasing our understanding of genome-environment interactions. Caspi et al., and I will put it up there, um, try to make this simple, report the findings of a longitudinal study of a large sample of boys in Dunedin, New Zealand. For some reason in this particular city, they've followed over a thousand boys from the time they were born until adulthood, and they have all kinds of biomarkers. They have, uh, so it's, uh, they have the possibility of then understanding how these kids' social and, and physical environment interacts with their genetic makeup to determine certain outcomes. Um, so look, the authors set it up in this particular way. They, they cite, note, call upon several studies that have shown that boys whose parents treat them in erratic, coercive, and punitive ways, kids who are mistreated, boys who are are at elevated risk of conduct disorder antisocial personality disorder and criminal activity later in life. So being beaten up by your parents, those boys tend to uh, you know, have a higher risk, as we say, of becoming antisocial in, in, uh, in adulthood. Uh, but not all boys, as we said, who are mis mistreated turn out to be criminals or to engage in antisocial behavior. Um, the authors then call, find another set of, of, of studies in which, uh, you know, they, they cite animal studies that are uh, at least one hu human study that suggests that a, fu a functional polymorphism in the ge gene encoding a particular enzyme, in this case monoamine oxidase A, this is a, an enzyme which breaks down neurotransmitters like, uh, like norepinef norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Different levels of that um, in interaction with the social environment were highly predictive of which boys would ultimately turn out to engage in, in antisocial behavior. So that, I mean, I won't go into the details. I suppose there's a lot of, I would be, like to really look at uh, the details of the study, and I have indeed. A particularly serious problem for me arises, uh, and as you probably well might imagine, though, in defining the outcome, you know, Antisocial behavior sort of illustrates a problem. Although the authors are very, very rigorous in their uh, definition of antisocial behavior, they really go to a lot of difficulty, or a lot of effort in order to deal with this thing. Uh, the definition of antisocial behavior is invariably, inevitably based on social norms and institutional factors like the probability of being arrested for a violent crime. Uh, antisocial behavior is not the same sort of variable as one's level of uh, uh, presence or absence of a particular polymorphism or even one's level of this particular enzyme. When groups are the unit of analysis, such approaches are, necessar are, are, are not necessarily useful, you know, just even talking about biological factors, and might even be dangerous. I mean, since we're talking about a a particular disadvantaged group, I think we need to deal with this. Attributing the high arrest and incarceration rates among black males to an interaction of specific biomarkers and environment wouldn't be straightforward and probably wouldn't make a great deal of sense, right? It would not make sense to attribute high rates of crime in general to individual factors or to even the interaction of individual factors and, uh, and the social environment social and physical environment. So, I mean, this is, this is a subtle problem that I think is very, very important to be, uh, that we consider. There's simply too much going on. There's too, many, too much noise, too many uncontrolled factors that determine, many of them social, that determine outcomes of that sort. 
the term overdetermined is what is again used in, in science to deal with these things. In the end, I think it's important not to lose sight uh, of the importance of considering all levels of analysis in, setting, in assessing individual and group risk factors. There are questions that I'm interested in insurance coverage, you know, in collective, in, in, in levels of education, dropout rates. These are, are characteristics of the collectivity. Certainly those rates are made up of the actions result from the actions or the behavior of individuals. But predicting those rates on some micro aspect characteristic of the individual is, uh, is tricky. Collective educational deficits or labor force disadvantages are unlikely to be explained even partially by genetics. Uh, and if you do so, you get into trouble. William Shockley and other advocates of eugenics, uh, we call back the eugenic movement, um, assume that entire groups can be characterized on the basis of biologically based predispositions or characteristics. So Shockley says, you know, African Americans have on average a 15 point deficit in IQ that reflects a real deficit in big G. And that then, David McClellan compared cultural groups across the world in terms of their need for achievement. For sort of, so, I mean, you know, I think there's a lot, of, a lot to be discussed here. Um, the potential results of certain so, those sorts of explanations strike me as being poor science and retrograde social policy, if one were really to act upon uh, on, on these sorts of questions. And the 20th century has got plenty of examples of the horrors that eugenic approaches and characterizations, biological characterizations, characterizations of groups uh, can lead to. Well, I'm gearing on here. Now, uh, so there are real dangers, in addition to real possibilities, there are real dangers in multi-level analyses that concern many observers. While refining the risk profiles for individuals uh, of, of individuals in terms of specific diseases um, is is good and, and and promises to great progress in uh, in uh, in improving people's lives, uh, there are great there are real serious considerations that I think the conference should uh, should tackle if if we want to go in that particular direction. Um, one might. Um, you know, I legitimately ask whether it even makes sense to look at genetic markers um, of such outcomes. Political dissidents in the Soviet Union were often given the diagnosis of slow progressive psychosis and, uh, and confined to insane asylums where they were stupefied by with the psychotropic medications and, and beaten. Um, so the misuse of genetic profiles is a real danger. One can imagine a world in which the applicant, an applicant to the State Department, is denied a security clearance on the basis that they have the gen genetic profile of a potential spy. And, you know, it could be more likely if given the opportunity, insurance companies might well deny individuals or even groups, entire groups, coverage on the basis of profiles that indicate an unprofitable genetic profile or high risk of some disease. So there are, there are real da dangers that people are concerned with. And I think these, uh, you know, since it is possible what geneticists do or engage in these something called, they're called gene, uh, genome-wide associational studies in which you get two groups. One group is a group of criminals, another the other group is a group of non-criminals, and just do a, 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 just a total search you know, a fishing expedition through the genome, see how they differ. And, you know, who knows what one will find. I mean, since it's possible, it's going to be, it's going to happen. How this information will be used is unclear. Very likely it will be deemed to be, hopefully it will be found to be useless in the long run. Um, but the possibility of real harm exists. And the real harm exists when these comparisons are between groups that are disadvantaged socially in various areas. Uh, so genetics can very easily be confused um, with other factors. There's, there's, the, there's the possibility of misattribution, as we say in social theory. Um, okay, close. Shut up, she says. Okay, currently the genetic approach is new and novel. Here we end. Uh, we have decoded the entire human genome, which is quite an accomplishment, much sooner than anybody expected. But the promising next steps are not clear. In 10 years, the novelty will be will have worn off, 
and what today is new and novel will be part of normal science. Through experimentation and trial and error, those areas uh, in which genetics proves useful will emerge and thrive. Those where it is not useful will not, hopefully. The challenge for us is to remain ever vigilant in order to benefit from new and potentially promising approaches while avoiding pseudoscience and approaches that are more rhetoric or uh, theoretical sleights of hand, really, than real contributions. Uh, when dealing with socially vulnerable groups, as I say again, the caveat cannot be made strongly enough. So I'll leave it there and say that uh, as we examine the issue, the, bio, the, contrib the differences or the process of aging, uh, it is imperative that, uh, that we deal with all of the difficulties inherent in combining these different level of, levels of analysis and not attribute, you know, and so we don't run the risk of attributing to biology or to uh, lower levels of analysis, I say here, uh, you know, disadvantages that are really socially constructed. So anyway, that is, uh, that's my charge to the conference as, as you proceed through your three days. Thank you. Okay. Oh, was I supposed to wait? Or make comments, yeah. criticisms, <laughs> heckle. Mm -hmm. Yes, damn, damn, damn. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a specific example of maybe a specific example of what we're talking about, about the, the effort to um, refine race and ethnicity in genetic terms. And I think there are a lot of mental logical problems with it. Uh, no, on the specific, on the specific, no, just a general, I think, you know, it would, would just be to reiterate what I said. You know, we have political categories. Race and ethnicity are, you know, white, we don't worry about the difference between French, Italians, and, and, and any longer. Uh, the, the major political categories these days are Asian, which is a completely huge mixture of people. Uh, African Americans, again, which is a, a huge, uh, you know, outbred group and uh, and Latinos of, of various and sundry sorts, and I think there 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 is behind a lot of this an attempt to uh, you know, an understandable attempt to be more precise in the identification of risk, but a very a serious confusion of the of the social social construct the category with with these things. So I mean, it's a really complicated set of issues that are that are simultaneously at, at hand. I think that's a problem across a wide, uh, a wide range of approaches these days that, that you've just identified. You know, there are legitimate things to do that become somewhat questionable when you tie them to, the, to, to these, these politically and socially sensitive issues. So, I mean, that's exactly what I say. This is sort of the charge of the, of the conference to discuss these things as one goes on. You know, there's aging, there are individuals, and it, well, once you do get, it, I mean, it's true, we all have a lineage. And we all have a risk profile that is influenced by where we come from. But, you know, the fact that being Mexican-American or African-American is, is not really part of that. That's, well, you're right. Yeah. You talk a lot about Right. Right. Right, right.
That's, that's, that's quite interesting. So much of social theory, I mean, we have structural functionalism, structural theories all over the place. The other end is symbolic interaction, actionism, uh, rational choice theory, a real focus on the individual symbol, yeah, exactly. Uh, how, you know, th I would leave that as a charge to the, uh, to the convention as well. How do you, you know, what does agency mean in the, you know, in the context of aging? Obviously, people make choices and part of, and part of this, uh, of what we're up to. Is, uh, is examining and studying the, the way in which they do so. What I think is important in this context, and the reason I, I framed it this way, is that we're not all the same in the extent to which we can exercise that particular, the, the means ends sort of calculus that we engage in is for some people more constrained than for others. If you've got more money, if you have more education, you know, a lot of the, the current philosophical de debates even over communicative competence Jürgen Habermas, uh, <laughs> deal with these sorts of things, you know, without, uh, and I think that that's where the interaction of, of whatever individual capacities one has, uh, they can be described very well, but they are, I think for us, the, it's those constraints, that we not confound the constraints, the structure, with aspects of the agency, of agency. I think that's what, uh, I'm most concerned with is that uh, you know individuals get blamed or attributions are mis that, that we engage in misattributions that we what you know in, in, in an equation or any kind of model um, you know if, if you are at the micro level it looks like micro level activities like micro level factors predicting micro level and you've lost the embedded higher uh, order structures in which that you know, process is embedded. So this is really a complicated set of issues that are going on here. And, and you know, the conference organizers wandered off into this morass and will have to uh, get themselves out of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>